So we've looked at genetic code, so DNA, and we've looked at proteins, all right? But now we're gonna, today, we're gonna actually link closely those two things together. We've loosely linked them, but we're gonna really clearly link them through two processes called transcription and translation, okay? Um, so remember that DNA, is what actually codes for your protein. So if you're a bit chubby like Mr. Mello, um, you should probably eat less, um, you should exercise more, and but most importantly, you should alter your genetic code with DNA of thin parents, so some thin protein DNA. <laughs> Hilarious. All right, um, have a go at the three quick questions and we'll have a look at these in class together. Okay. So in the study design, we're still looking at this nucleic acid and proteins part. Um, once again, the information molecules that include instructions for the synthesis of proteins and cells. All right. This time we're going to actually specifically talk about the genetic code as a degenerate triplet code and the steps in what we call gene expression, which is probably, I know it's a lot of big words in bio, but it's probably one of the most important words in this area of biology, including what we call transcription. RNA processing in eukaryotic cells, and translation, which are two really important processes. All right, we're also going to go on to the next dot point called gene structure and regulation, because we're actually going to look at what are genes made up of? How, how do genes look in eukaryotic cells, specifically the more complicated types of cells, including what we call stop and start instructions, promoter regions, and these two guys, exons and introns. All right, what a journey. Let's do it. So I want you in three words, have a go at summarizing what is meant by the role of DNA and RNA, just using three words. Hopefully you manage to get two code proteins. <laughs> That's what the role of DNA and RNA is, okay? So here we have DNA making some RNA, RNA reads by the ribosome makes some protein, okay? That's the role of DNA and RNA. But how does a four-letter DNA code, so how does the A, T, Gs, and Cs of DNA specify for the instruction for 20 different amino acids? Have you thought of that? Well, DNA is actually interpreted in what we call triplets, okay? So each amino acid is coded by a specific triplet of nitrogenous bases, and this means that the number of possible codes is actually increased exponentially. So when we say a triplet, what we mean is this. So for example, this ATG is one triplet, okay? So let's have a look at this now, a bit of maths. So each of the four ATG and ATCGs that can show up in each position of a triplet, all right? So that actually means that we, we multiply four to the power of three, or four times four times four, which means that we actually have 64 different possible triplets. Don't believe me, start counting them out. A, 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 T, and so on and so on and so on, all the way to you get G, G, G. All right, there's 64 possible ones of those. Well, we only have 20 amino acids, all right? And this starts to highlight for us the fact that DNA code is either redundant or we call degenerate. Okay, so we actually have more possible triplets than we have possible amino acids, okay? All right, let's talk about the first process of making some proteins out of DNA. And this first process is called transcription, all right? Um, the other one is called translation. So I remember transcription because cryption so starts with a C and C comes before L. So transcription comes first. And transcription is all about reading the code. So we're actually going to read what's on the DNA code and we're going to rewrite it somewhere else. Exactly how it is with the only minor difference that that U, the T's are going to turn into U. So the thymine is going to turn into uracil. Okay, so let's go through this process. First DNA, remember it's in a helix, so we have to unwind that DNA, so we, we're left with like a linear DNA, and we unzip the middle, so remember how the A's and the T's are together, okay, and the G's and the C's are together, so we have to unzip those guys off each other, just like you see here, here where they're together, right, and then they're unzipped here by a specific kind of enzyme that does that. All right, the coding strand, which are here on this diagram, is the blue strand, 
all right, is the side that actually contains the code that's specific to the gene of interest, uh, to the protein of interest, okay? So for example, here the code might be C, T, G, A, T, okay? So what's actually copied is the template strand, so this green strand, all right, because it's complementary to the coding strand, all right? So this template strand is copied on into a messenger or an mRNA molecule, okay, that's taken out of the nucleus, okay? This mRNA is going to contain a code that's going to be identical to this guy up here, the template strand, okay, or the sorry, sorry, not the template, the coding strand, except the usual RNA differences, okay? So for example, U's are going to be replaced, are going to be replacement of the T's, okay? So where do we start copying? How do we know that we have to start copying? Remember, your DNA is millions of base pairs long. So a particular sequence of non-coding DNA called either the promoter sequence or us call biologists, we like to call it the tartar box, all right, um, actually signals for the mRNA to start copying at the start sequence. That's the reason we call it tartar box, by the way, is because it's actually a series of ta 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 ta. So it's really obvious for the DNA polymerase, which is the protein that does this, sorry, RNA polymerase, which is a protein that does this, to come and see that says ta 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 ta. So that's where we're going to start, okay? And, well, it's not what's going to start, it's, it's where the DNA protein is going to bind, but it's going to actually start at this specific start sequence, okay? The stop sequence, then, is at the end of the gene of interest, which signals for the mRNA to simply stop copying the template strand, okay? Pretty straightforward. So let's have a look at this, okay? So here we have this guy, this enzyme that we call RNA polymerase, probably one of the most important enzymes that we'll see, all right? RNA polymerase finds this promoter or tartar sequence here, which is represented in green, all right? And then once at the end of this promoter tartar sequence, we have the start site, all right? So it's gonna, as soon as those tartars end, it's gonna start copying what's in orange here, which is the Dean gene. So here we can see it's starting the synthesis here. In blue, we can see is the mRNA, all right? Um, don't worry about the sigma factor, not too important. The mRNA polymerase is gonna start running down the DNA, okay? And it's gonna start copying and growing this mRNA strand, which we have here. When it gets to the stop sequence, the, M, the RNA polymerase jumps off. Okay, so here it is jumped off. All right. um, once it jumps off, the mRNA is now ready to go on to its next step, which is actually transforming this mRNA, which we call pre-mRNA, into mature mRNA. We sometimes call this post transcriptional, oops, close transcriptional modifications, if you ever see it named that, pretty straightforward, post, after, so it's the modifications that happen after transcription, okay? So here we have transcription, we have that pre-mRNA, all right, the pre-mRNA it has inside of it all of these things that we call exons and these things we have introns. They're just sequences of that mRNA, so A, T, U, A, U, G, and Cs, okay? First thing that happens is the five prime capping, all right, which, with what we call a methyl, methyl cap, okay? Um, that just protects the mRNA a little bit. After that, what we have happening is a really important process called alternative splicing, okay? What happens in alternative splicing is, in simplest form, we get rid of these introns, okay? How I remember that is that introns are going to stay in the nucleus, okay? And the exons all stick together and they're going to be the guys that exit, the nucleus, okay? So the introns are all cut out and the exons are spliced together, okay? All of the introns cut out. This is actually a really important process though because sometimes what happens is some introns, for example, this middle one, for example, 
can turn into exons and so can be included in. For example, this intron would then be in the middle here. What would happen then is a different protein gets made. Right? And this is a really important thing because like we were talking about, we have less genes than we actually have proteins. Last little process of um, post-transcriptional modifications is the addition of what we call the poly A tail. So it's a tail, it's the bottom, and it just protects the DNA, and it's just made up of lots and lots of adenines. Oh, all right, next step of making proteins is all about translation. So transcription is all about reading that book that is DNA and rewriting it onto mRNA. Translation, just like translation in real life, is reading that mRNA code and actually changing the language. All right, so we're going to change it from nucleotide language, right, code, the language of DNA and RNA, and change it to the language of proteins. What do we call that? The peptide or the amino acid language. Okay, so the mRNA moves into the ribosome, which is either in the cytoplasm or on top of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, all right? And the information that's actually stored on each mRNA is grouped into units of three again, but instead of calling them triplets, we call them codons, okay? And they're gonna be, but they're gonna be the same as the triplets on that coding DNA. It's just a slightly different name, okay? So here it is. So that mRNA is running through this ribosome, all right? And each pair of three, so for example, here these last three, UUC, is what we call a codon, okay? At the ribosome, we have these guys that are represented in yellow with a little pink amino acid on them. So that's what this thing is, it's an amino acid and these guys are tRNAs which are that last group of RNAs that we talked about and each tRNA has a complementary anti-codon on it okay so codon down here and anti-codon up here okay that anticodon is going to join up here, just like this one has here, with the mRNA, so that the ribosome knows that that's the right amino acid it's adding, okay? And it's going to start adding amino acids to what is the polypeptide chain, okay? Because all of these amino acids are now linked together through those peptide bonds that we've already talked about. Cool? A few little points to note. Okay, the first little point is we just touched on before is all about the degenerate or redundant genetic code. Okay, so first of all, the code on AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. Okay, and what the methionine also is, it's the instruction to start the synthesis of polypeptide. All right, so at the very start of every single polypeptide is AUG. Okay. The other three codons, which are actually quite important, you don't have to memorize these, but you just have to know that ex they exist, is UAA, UAG, and UGA. And they're the codons that code for nothing, all right? So they actually signal for the synthesis of the polypeptide to stop. So for example, here, if down the line here, we've got, oops, sorry, UAG, that would be the very end other polypeptide sequence. And we stop. Yeah, we would stop at this phenylalanine here. Okay? All right. So let's see this happening a little bit. So here we have in black the mRNA strand. Okay? The mRNA strand is running through this two subunit organelle, which is the ribosome, and every single little black uh, sorry, blue one of these guys is a tRNA, all right? As you can see, these light blue stuff, that's all just enzymes, by the way. They're, they're just helping out with the job, okay? But what these tRNA molecules are doing, they're going to be specific to codons on this amino acid, and they're going to have anticodons on them, all right? And each one is going to have, they're going to be charged, and they're going to add a specific amino acid to this polypeptide sequence. What's happening here is the amino, the ribosome is joining up. This is the wall of the endoplasmic reticulum, okay? And that endoplasmic reticulum 
is just where that DNA is going to be, uh, that, that protein, that polypeptide chain, the primary structure of this polypeptide chain is going to be taken up, all right, because it's going to be reformatted and folded here, all right, f for packaging to taken outside of the cell, just like we've seen. So what, this degenerate thing, let's have a look at this degenerate or redundant genetic code, okay? Um, on the wall of the classroom, we've got a bit of a table, it's a bit prettier than this one, but it's the exact same information. As you can see in this table, we've got, I want you to look at the amino acids which are coded by um, codons with the code with the first letter as C, the second letter as U, and the third letter as anything. So U, C, A, or G, right? If you find that, all you have to do is go, here's the C part, here's the U bit, okay? And there is the U, C, A, and G. So we're actually talking about the amino acids that are all in this box. And they all code for leucine, all right? Not only they code for leucine, but these guys up here also code for leucine, all right? And that's what we mean by degenerate or redundant, okay? Some letters, uh, some um, codons are actually irrelevant, all right? So for example, as long as you have a C or an U, well, you're gonna get leucine, all right? If you have a UUA or a UUG, you're still gonna get leucine, all right? That's what we mean by redundancy of the DNA code, okay? Um, and this is important because it means that we only have the 20 amino acids that we're looking for, okay? Um, also, a few things that happens after the, the protein gets actually translated, all right, so made into that protein polypeptide chain, okay, you don't have to memorize any of these. All you have to know is that they're called post-translational modifications, so it's pretty simple to remember, all right? But we've got things like phosphorylation and addition of phosphate to that protein, all right? Or with glycolization, we get addition of a sugar, okay? Um, so lots and lots of methylation, addition of a methyl group, okay? Um, so lots and lots of different possible things that can happen to that protein in terms of post-translational modifications, okay, before it actually becomes an actual protein, okay? Um, I want to watch this video with you in class, so um, remind me and we'll, I'll turn this video on in class and we'll actually see this process of transcription translation happening, okay?